good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, just give us a couple of minutes um, as while we sort of hit this wonderful button that says we are to go live. It takes a while for that uh, to be received by all our wonderful attendees this evening. Um, so let's just uh, wait a couple of minutes so everyone um, can join us. Hope you're all keeping well and managing to get out in nature. Um, beautiful day today. Um, I had my lunch outside, it was a real treat. <laughs> right, we seem to have um, stopped um, receiving attendees for the moment. Um, so um, I'm going to sort of welcome you all to, um, to tonight's webinar. Um, with the wonderful David Lindo, um, our urban birder. And um, he's going to talk to us tonight about uh, birds. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all about that. Um, had a fantastic evening the last time he gave us a talk. Um, so before we start, just a tiny bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will be taking questions. Um, so please use the question and answer feature. Um, just type in your question and I will see it and read it out to David at the appropriate time. Um, the chat function is on, um, so if you have any technical problems, um, please let um, us know. Um, hopefully the sound is coming through clear and you'll be able to see David's presentation. Um, so without further delay, I'm going to um, pass on to David. Sophie, um, thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you very much for the invitation back and I must extend that thank you to, uh, to the members because obviously they asked for me to be back and it's great to be back. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, migration in urban areas and this is a talk I was meant to do the first time around for those who tuned in the last time but um, as fate would have it, I couldn't do it because I'd, uh, my hard drive had broken down. And what a good turn of fate that was, because it meant that I can spend more time with you guys. So I'm really happy about that. Um, right, so we might as well get cracking with the talk. Um, I want to say firstly that this is not a scientific talk. Um, it's more about just talking about general sort of ideas regarding migration and also more importantly hopefully to inspire you to sort of leave your house tomorrow morning or at least go outside and just look up to see if you can notice any migration so i will share my talk with you now i hope that you can see this okay and also one thing to remember is that if you are watching and you're not too um, familiar with zoom if you put your setting on to uh, speaker view, then you get the whole picture as opposed to seeing all the gallery, the motley crew of everyone in the actual meeting. So there you go. All right, so migration in urban areas. I, as a kid, as an urban birder, which is both the same really, because I'm still both, I love watching the flux of movement when it comes to birds. Um, you know, spring, autumn, are two of my favorite times of the year. And as a child, I used to think that migration only occurred during one month in September for 30 days and then that was it. And then nothing else either side. Um, so I felt very upset when October came thinking that it was all over. But in reality, there is a lot more to migration than that. In fact, it's one of those things that you can never, we don't know anything is a short answer. We, we know very little about migration. We're discovering new things all the time. But the thought that we have about migration is often the idea of massive flocks of birds all heading over en masse. And yeah, that is the case in some instances. This is a bunch of uh, black tail godwits and there's a solitary uh, red shank in amongst them near the top middle. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's right underneath this one here. Can you see my cursor? You can. Okay, it's right there. So that's a red chain. 
Um, but yeah, it's great to, to see large numbers of birds moving. And it's not just, you know, confined to tropical areas. This is a load of greater flamingos, which were actually photographed in Lisbon or just actually from Lisbon looking out. And these guys spend uh, the winter in the uh, Tagus estuary, which unfortunately is under threat uh, because I want to build an airport on there. I don't know why, because there's going to be bird strikes. But anyway, they want to build an airport. And it's one of those places where, in fact, it is one of the most important uh, staging posts for shorebirds in Europe. It's just amazing. And if you haven't been there, you should try once we, you know, get a corridor or can travel a little, <laughs> a little bit more, try and add that to your list if you haven't been to, to Lisbon and Tagus Estuary. It's an amazing place. But yeah, migration comes in all different shapes and forms. And tonight, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to talk to you about a couple of very general types of migration that you can notice when you are out and about in your normal lives, uh, looking around yourselves in Surrey. This is a bunch of linnets with a couple of starlings in the background, which I took in Ireland. So, you know, anything can turn up anywhere in terms of these flocks of birds. It's beautiful. Um, I want to show you... Um, the magic of um, migration as well tonight. I want to talk and show you some of the places in the world where there are so many different um, beautiful things to notice. Now, there are several reasons why birds move and some um, actually exhibit different types of migration even within the same species. There's some indul that indulge on migrations to molt, like waterfowl such as shell duck, and there's others that kind of are constantly on the move and then there's yet others that do these incredible migrations like for example the sooty shearwater which does a figure of eight migration it, it, it breeds in the southeast Atlantic Ocean and then it kind of sweeps across the, um, the coast of uh, Western Africa into North America sweeps back around us and then comes over into the coast uh, along the coast of East and South America before coming back to breed. It's just an incredible migration that they do. So I just love the idea of migration. It's just incredible. Anyway, we're going to talk about several different types and the most, um, I suppose one of the, the, the classic types which we don't actually think about much is when young birds disperse because in a way that is migration. Migration is a movement from one spot to another and that spot could not may necessarily, may could, should I say, could be, you know, very far, or it could be very, very small distances. And if you look at birds like, for example, the house sparrow, you know, a lot of them are breeding in areas and they generally move literally no more than a mile to explore new areas. And these, this is what these birds do. I mean, birds like great tits, blue tits, um, and also a goldfinch, uh, especially you must see in the autumn uh, or late summer flocks of young birds they all go on mass they all feed on mass and they very effectively sort of exploring their territory to see if there's anywhere else where they can actually move on to when they become adults and that's basically how i suppose species spread they permeate out slightly so these birds do that but there's others like for example um, the starling which is also um, a dispersive bird in terms of juveniles because obviously you see in the winter flocks of young birds easy young birds i saw in ireland once um, and they all hang out together move around together but they also display full-on migration as well within the same species which is quite interesting it just shows that not every species has one type of movement it depends on where they are based in the world and their food sources and lots of other factors and some factors that we don't actually understand. So another type is eruptive migration. Now eruptive migration, as you can see, often concerns species that um, we see in the UK on occasion. And one classic is the waxwing. The waxwing breeds in Scandinavia and depending on the kind of food supply in the autumn, winter, if there's not a good berry harvest, then they'll move to search for new areas where there's berries. And one classic sign in terms of predicting 
how many birds will be coming to the UK, apparently, is that if you are in Aberdeen and it's November and all of a sudden there's a whole ton of waxwings descending upon the city, then you're going to know that it's going to be a massive year for waxwings. That seems to be the, uh, the litmus paper, I've been told, because people, you know, have, have gauged the, 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 the extent of the numbers of birds by that. Um, so some winters we have very few, other winters there's a huge amount. And they think it's actually sparked by food availability, as I said, but it's not totally known if that is fully the case. I mean, in some instances, yes, it is, but in others, it's not quite known. It's some more waxwings for you. But species such as, for example, the rose-coloured starling, another beautiful bird that shows up in the UK now and again. Um, for those who don't know, it's like a starling, but it's the, the adults have got a lovely pink body and this interesting kind of punky crest at the back of their heads and yellow bills. And they turn up, um, again, in varying numbers. I mean, not massive numbers like waxwings, but they turn up. And some years um, we've had good years where there's been several in the country at once. But further east in Europe, the eruptions are actually a lot bigger. Um, I think a couple of years ago there was quite a lot of them, hundreds of them, that spread into Europe. And we in the UK were really excited thinking, oh, there's going to be some turning up in Britain. And yes, there were a couple, um, but nowhere as much as there were in Central and Eastern Europe. And I'm situated in Spain at the moment, but I know that my colleagues in Spain were getting quite itchy to see them as well. And <coughs> excuse me, it turned out that um, only a couple showed up and most of them were up by Barcelona, which makes me think that there could actually be quite a few that came further south but weren't seen because Spain is quite a big place and not as many birders as there are in the UK. Another classic species that indulges in eruptive migrations is a bird called a palisid sand grouse and I haven't got a picture unfortunately of one but the palisid sand grouse if you can imagine uh, well it belongs to a family of called sand grouse and they are kind of a blend between a pigeon and a wader so they're kind of interesting they're mostly living in deserts or arid arid, arid areas and the palisid sand grouse, uh, sand grouse is no exception because it actually lives over in, in Asia, in the steppes. Um, so it lives in arid places. And every now and again, they erupt in massive numbers. Um, the last time that happened in a big way was in the late 1800s, when they reached as far as the UK and even stopped to breed. Can you believe it? There was, I think there was a couple nesting just outside London in Kingsbury. Well, actually that's London now, but then it was just outside London and even as far north as up in Scotland. So that was incredible that these desert birds suddenly en masse just erupted out across Europe. Um, there's been a few other eruptions of palaces, sand grouses, sand grouse even, because there's no such plural as sand grouses. It's grouse, just like snipe and snipe and woodcock and woodcock. You never say woodcocks or snipes, do you? Anyway, sand grouse, um, there was a couple um, explosions recently when I say explosions invasions incursions but only a couple have ever turned up in the UK in the last 30 years or so so we are awaiting another invasion of those amazing birds but another bird that shows up here occasionally um, again as a, as a result of this incursion from their native Scandinavia is the nutcracker and this is a species that it's long awaited here I, mean, I don't think there's been a record of one for the last few years. They are a member of the crow family. They look like a sort of a slim jay in build um, and they're quite inquisitive and normally, well, sometimes quite approachable as this bird was. So one to look out for in the winter, depends. But it all actually can be kind of calculated when you look at the situation in Scandinavia during the breeding season. if. You know, our colleagues up there are saying that birds are struggling to find food, then there's a good possibility they may actually erupt this way. Going back to the waxwings, actually, um, it's really interesting with waxwings because I don't know how many of you guys have seen them, but they are one of those birds that you are actually better off in an urban area seeing them than if you were in the middle of the countryside. Luckily, a lot of our councils 
um, have planted cataniesta and rowan trees um, in the streets and some of our shopping centres have them in their car parks so it's always worth checking out those places during the height of winter in case a flock just shows up. They're amazing to see. And you'd think that everyone would notice them, but I remember once um, 150 or so turned up um, on a street just off Tottenham Court Road in central London. And I remember going to Twitch them on the way to work. And I was standing there admiring this amazing flock, feeding on berries, sometimes just over head height, so maybe just six and a half foot above your head. Not even above your head, but six and a half foot up, you know, so above most people's heads. And I was watching these dumb coloured office workers in their suits and briefcases, just walking, powering down the street with their blinkers on and not even looking up. And I'm thinking, look up, just look at that bird. Spend two seconds looking. It will make you feel amazing. You will get a pay rise. You will enjoy your work today. But of course, they just kept on powering through. I just don't know for the life of me how they actually did not get to see those birds. Right, um, another form of migration I want to quickly run past you is partial migration. And that's when, I suppose, strictly speaking, when part of a population moves from one area to another. So, for example, this is a bearded tit. They indulge themselves in partial migrations, moving from, from northern areas, maybe a little bit west in Europe, a little bit west, or you might get a couple that move from in the, the mainland, the main sort of areas where they breed in, say, East Anglia, and move to another reed bed somewhere else further south during the winter. There was an occasion when two birds turned up in Hyde Park, in a reed bed which was about the size of a living room. I mean, it's incredible that they turned up in that habitat, but there they were. And I thought it'd be rude not to actually go and check them out. So I remember going to see them and that night, I used to be a, a big blogger at the time, I wrote a blog. And for those who don't know, by the way, the bearded tit or the bearded reedling, to give it its, its real name, its, its official name, it's not actually a tit at all. It's, it was considered to be a member of a, a family called parrotbills, um, who are predominantly found in Asia. But I think now they've actually moved the, the, the bearded reedling into its own little family. So they're not related to tits at all. But I remember going back home and writing my blog and saying, I saw a pair of false tits in Hyde Park. And I had so many people come to my blog that night. It was untrue. It was incredible, but there you go. Um, another unlikely partial migrant, you don't think of them as partial migrants, is this guy, the robin. You know, we think, ah, oh, the robin's a British bird, it's here at my doorstep every year. And I think I may have told you guys already, but I've upset a lot of people by saying, actually, um, they don't live very long for a start. You know, two years is usually the maximum. And a lot of kids do get upset when I tell them that. So I've stopped telling people that now. In fact, I've told you, but don't tell anyone else. This is between us. Um, that said, I remember being in Israel and there was a bird that they pulled out of a ring, out of um, a net and it had a ring on it. And its ring was 007 and it was actually seven years old. But these birds are interesting because some, according to my colleagues at the British Trust for Ornithology, some of them uh, that are born here then in the winter migrate south into Iberia and they tend to be females, leaving the males behind. So they are a classic example of partial migration. And also, whilst they in the winter are sort of depleted by the females heading off, there are birds from further east in continental Europe that come west and spend the winter in Britain. And they tend to be slightly greyer around the sides of their face and their red throat and chest is slightly different in its hue. I mean, you know, it's going to be difficult to tell them apart if you saw them in the back garden, but if you saw one in, you know, in Germany, you may kind of see the difference. They are very different in terms of the behaviour, by the way. It really is um, fitting to have it as the national bird of Britain because, you know, they're feisty, they're territorial, they love picking fights, very much like Britain, but also the fact that they are so confiding, whereas in Europe, 
They are still birds of their natal woodland. Um, another partial migrant, again, you may not necessarily consider, uh, is the blackbird, our humble blackbird. Um, in the winter, quite a few um, migrate from Scandinavia to escape the conditions there to winter in Britain. And, you know, I've actually been on the east coast in Norfolk and seen hundreds flying over in flocks with red wings and field fares. You know, so you don't actually think of them being migrants. There was a, um, a time when people thought that the ones from Scandinavia were easier to recognise because they had black bills. They were sort of, for some reason, not fully adult yet. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. But what is for sure is that when they do uh, catch them and ring them, they tend to have slightly longer wings than our native birds. And anecdotally, they are slightly more skittish than our ones. But even so, they are partial migrants that come to Britain during the winter. Another partial migrant, which I was very surprised myself to find out about, is the Dunnock. Um, I remember being in Latvia one autumn and I was with my guide and we looked up and there was this tiny dot flying overhead calling. And I was thinking, what's that? I've never heard that call before. He said, oh, that's a Dunnock. And I was thinking, Dunnock? I'm more used to them on the floor, you know, under your bird table, to be like so high up in the sky. He said, yeah, it's migrating. So these birds, again, are, you know, within certain populations, move. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to migration, you've got to kind of not think about whole populations like swallows moving from leaving Britain and heading somewhere else and there's none during the winter, but think sometimes that there's a whole range of flux within the same population or within the same species. Another form of migration is altitudinal. Um, migration that occurs because of conditions high up in mountains. And there's, there's a few birds that do that. And there's only, I suppose, only one in the UK that we can actually really claim to, to be doing that. And that's the, uh, the ptarmigan. Um, it's a bird that uh, in the Britain, I suppose, is only to be found in the Cairngorms. I've only ever seen them there. I think that's only where they're, they're seen. And this is a female nest, nesting, but they tend to uh, come from the tops of the mountains down to about 500 meters during the winter to escape some of the harsher conditions further up. Another altitudinal migrant is this guy, but he's a bit of a different one. It's not a strict up, down, you know, up a mountain, down a mountain type of migrant. This is a water pipit. Um, in the UK, um, we find them in small numbers in marshy areas, the love watercress beds. They are a little bit like a meadow pipit, but as you can see, a little bit more cleaner looking, less streaky, with a nice eyebrow. This is uh, in winter plumage, but when it gets into summer or the breeding plumage, it becomes this beautiful sort of blue with, well, bluish kind of greyish head and a bit of a sort of a chestnutty chest. They come, become very, very colorful. Um, but they nest in alpine areas and instead of just going straight down, they tend to sort of spread out west and into places like our, you know, marshy areas, or as this one is in a rice field. Um, so their, their migration is slightly weird. It's not quite a full on migration either, but it's not quite altitudinal either. So they, but they are classed as altitudinal migra migrants, whereas the, uh, Alpine Accenta is a classic altitudinal migrant. This is a bird this, which is related to the Dunnock, same family. In fact, the Dunnock's proper name is Hedge Accenta. So this is the Alpine Accenta. Um, there's about, I think, 11 species in the world of Accenta. Most of them are found in Asia. There's two found in Europe. This is a very rare visitor to the UK. But again, they breed up in the mountains and then come lower down during the winter. And in Spain, for example, um, I see them usually in the winter when they're lower down uh, on the mountain sides in the foothills and you can actually see them feeding on the grass or in the grass uh, looking for insects and other bits and pieces. Interesting birds actually, accentors are, even though they have a thin insectivorous bill, uh, apparently according to DNA and looking at the, uh, at the, the, the sort of uh, the build up and makeup, um, are more closely related to buntings which I, again, found quite surprising. 
Then we have the complete and utter, let's go for it, migration, where birds just move from one sector to another. This is an Arctic tern, a classic, one of the most classic migrants that sort of heads from the south, or should I say from the north, to the south every year. They see more daylight than any other creature on the planet. You know, they travel humongous amounts of miles, I think like 22,000 miles uh, a year. Although I do remember the um, figure of 60,000 for some reason. I'm not sure how, how, I need to work that one out. I think it could be a few years. But anyway, they travel a lot to, uh, to get away from their areas. Now, the reason why birds migrate um, are several fold, but mostly because they are in areas where there's food, but then in a different season, that food isn't available. So they have to move in order to survive. So it's a survival thing. And what's more, they may possibly compete with other birds um, if they stay or if they move to their winter quarters and stay there, they may compete with the birds there. So they have to keep moving in order to get the best food sources. And also, when on migration, a bird goes through um, a physiological and a psychological change. So the, on the physiological side, some of their organs shrink, like their stomach, for example. I mean, they, they put on a lot of fat, but then their, their stomachs shrink. So that when they're actually on migration, food is not you know the most important thing because they have their stores. Their pectoral muscles, their chest muscles, their flight muscles uh, expand, as does their heart. And psychologically, they become very agitated. They're very sort of, you know, we must, we must go, we must go. They kind of get to the point where they feel that they need to move on. And many species actually have a molt, which sometimes lasts a month before they actually move. So they're in complete tip-top condition. Now, it's really important to be in tip-top condition. If you're too fat, you're gonna be slow. And if you're slow, you could be predated. If you haven't got enough fat, you're not gonna be strong enough. And if you're not strong enough, you're gonna be predated. So it's really a fine balance to make sure that you actually keep yourself totally and utterly fit and ready for the long journey. And the other thing is that some birds have, uh, even though they may migrate on, uh, on a massive scale, for example, you know, our warblers, a lot of our warblers migrate, they all have different strategies. So for example, the sedge warbler um, and the willow warbler, both our summer visitors to the UK, we're looking forward to them coming soon. They should be with us, or some of, us, some of them should be with us by next month. Now, when they are leaving to head south to winter in sub-Saharan Africa, the sedge warbler doesn't put on as much fat as a reed warbler. And the reason for that is that the sedge warbler has many breaks in its journey. And there was an account that I read where uh, birds flew to southern England, fed up, flew again, stopped off in northern France, fed up, then fat traveled further south, maybe to southern France or even southern Spain, stopped to feed again, and then crossed the Sahara. And the interesting thing about the, the crossing of the Sahara is that they tend to take two, three days to do it, um, and they don't touch a drop of water, obviously, because there's no water there, and they migrate at night. Small birds migrate at night in the main. And there's reasons that are still being disputed, but I think the, the classic reasons are because it's cooler to travel at night in terms of the temperature. Um, and it means that if it's cooler, it means you expend less energy. The air is stiller. There's less wind. There's more chances to use navigational signs such as the stars, um, as well as magnetic the magnetic fields might be easier to follow at night perhaps and also the possibility that you're less likely to be predated but going back to the sedge warbler and reed warbler the reed warbler um, actually puts on more fat and flies a much further distance than the sedge warbler so he does his journey or her journey in much more of a continuous flight than the sedge warbler so even though you know to look at you think they both do the same thing. In reality, there's lots of different uh, nuances in, in their patterns of migration. But what I love about 
the spring is to suddenly walk out one day, visit your local patch, and suddenly you see a bird that's turned up. This is a wind chat. To see a wind chat, you know that it's traveled all that way from Africa. It's flown over the heads of giraffes and lions. It's flown over wars. It's flown over a massive desert. It's flown over people shooting at them in the Mediterranean, North Africa and, and the Southern Europe. And it's flown all that way to be with you for a short period before it then heads on. A lot of the birds that actually you see in urban areas on migration are not necessarily heading to locations in the UK to breed. Um, some species tend to head straight for their, their breeding spots. So pied flycatchers, for example, are known to just head straight to Wales once they, they hit the UK. The ones that you tend to see stopping can be birds that are heading off to Scandinavia. Or in the case of the wheat here, some of them are even heading on further to places like Greenland. In fact, the wheat here has the accolade of the most longest in terms of flying migrant of its size on the planet. They can do a round trip of 18,000 miles. It's just incredible, such a tiny little thing will travel all that way. But that's what happens, you know, it's, it's the fact that they have to move to find places to breed, to find places where there's less competition um, for food and you know to go to Greenland you have less competition from other land passerines but then on the negative side you have a humongous journey to travel. Um, some species are really suffering on their migrations this is a turtle dove and we all know the story here they are you know I think in the UK 90% depleted I remember people telling me about flocks migrating over Norfolk heading south of hundreds and now you're lucky to see one or two a year even, you know, let alone seeing them in, in flocks. Um, I've seen a few in Spain. I tend to see them in, in five or sixes, which is nice. And I've been to Israel where I've still managed to see quite a few flying through, but that's because it's a bit of a bottleneck in Israel. But by the time they come to Europe and especially Britain, the numbers are depleted, unfortunately, because of hunting. Um, shooting on the spring migrations is a ridiculous idea because it means that there's less adults breeding and then shooting them on return, it's just, it's just crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. I'm just, I found one um, in Spain that had been shot and I, my heart bled. I just couldn't believe that someone would want to shoot that and just leave it on the ground. It's just terrible. Anyway, my cursor's going a bit strange. Um, the classic summer migrant is the swallow. I don't believe for one second that one swallow makes a summer actually. I think one swift makes a summer because swallows tend to come earlier and you know that summers really come when the swifts and the uh, spotted flycatchers and cuckoos arrive. You know, yeah, this is summer definitely. But again, it's a bird that migrates fast distances. Um, a lot of our breeding birds end up um, spending their non-breeding time in southern Africa. But what always fascinated me was how come when I'm in Spain I'm seeing swallows as early as January yet you guys in England are not seeing them until you know at the very earliest now. And there is a, a, suppos a supposition that different populations actually winter in different areas of Africa and sometimes within those populations, the birds that live in southern locations in Europe may leave later or earlier, shall I say, may, may leave earlier or actually may not even leave their area for wintering and stay in their breeding area. And I've noticed this a lot with house martins and swallows in Spain. Um, I have four pairs of swallows, sorry, house martins nesting on my balcony and I've seen swallows through every month of the year. In fact, two years ago, they were breeding in a village uh, in uh, Extremadura in December, house martins. So it's just incredible how potentially climate change and other factors might be affecting uh, the birds' migration. And I had the pleasure of chatting to an ornithologist, Per Olström, a Swedish ornithologist. He has a theory that birds like the swallow may eventually develop into a different species because it's been noted that the birds heading to southern Africa, some of them 
are not actually heading back and they're nesting in Southern Africa. So they could potentially over a period of time become resident and develop into being their own species. Um, another bird we don't actually think of as being a migrant, but it is, um, is the puffin. You know, they come here to breed and they then, during the late summer, August time, all scarper to the middle of the sea somewhere, not to be seen again until the following spring. You know, so they too conduct a migration. Of course, migration is not just summer visitors arriving and then leaving. It also entails winter visitors and uh, a classic winter visitor, the field fair. Um, I'm sure there's still some hanging around in Surrey at the moment. I've seen them as late as May. I remember once at Wormwood Scrubs, my beloved Wormwood Scrubs in West London, standing there watching a field fair shoulder to shoulder with a wheat ear. Now, I was thinking, ah, oh, a winter visitor leaving and a summer visitor arriving. But then when you think about it in a global sense, actually that doesn't, that's not so special at all because if you go east, if you go, you know, if you go to Estonia or someplace like that, or Poland, you may possibly see both of them together anyway because they both breed in those areas. So it's interesting how our perceptions in Britain are of certain birds. We just can see them as a winter bird, whereas in other places they are, oh, they're, they're here all the time or they're here during the summer. Um, the Spanish actually look forward to seeing uh, field fairs um, and in Spain they, the, the name for them um, is uh, translated as the royal thrush because they come, they look so proud. You've seen them in your garden, haven't you? They're very, they stand there proud, they're big, they're quite territorial as well. Um, but when you see them on their breeding grounds, I was very disappointed. I was deflated actually. I remember being in Moscow and going to a park and finding a colony because they, they're nesting in colonies. And they got a crap song. Uh, they look scruffy. You know, I was thinking, what happened to the bird I see you know, when I'm in London? But that's the feel fair. Now, this is also the time when we all get a bit excited because we're on the lookout for a variety of different things coming our way. Um, first of the summer migrants, but as well as that, birds that may turn up by accident or whatever reason, known as vagrants. So, for example, this picture I took of my Nokia back in the day when if you had a camera on your phone, you were like something special. Um, this is a ruff, a juvenile ruff that was in the round pond or along the edge of the round pond in Hyde Park. In fact, Kensington Gardens, to be, to be exact. And it was walking around with starlings. You could get within two feet of it, three feet of it. It probably hadn't seen humans before. It's just probably left its breeding grounds in Eastern Europe, flew directly over here, landed in the first bit of water it saw, and there it was. So that's a classic example of a migrant moving through, but sort of turning up in a place where you wouldn't expect it to turn up. More expected are some of the scarcities that we all look for, especially in the autumn. Um, this is a barred warbler on Spurn Point, and uh, one of the birds that people in the autumn are really excited to look for and to see. There's often a movement of birds that occur, and sometimes they are blown off course and end up in the UK. Vagrancy is an interesting subject because there is a school of thought that says that some of these birds are actually vanguards of populations. They, they deliberately kind of fly off, slightly off from where they should be going to discover new lands. A bit like Vikings, maybe. I don't know. I'll, I'll think about that one. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of places that are really interesting for migration. One is a place called um, Cape May, which is roughly here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Cape May is in, um, if you follow Sopranos, New Jersey. And in Cape May, um, there's a, a, an observatory. It's one of those spots in, West, in Eastern uh, America where people go to watch migration. And the migration apparently is, is, is fabled. I mean, I've been there once. I remember standing on uh, one of the, uh, what they call bluffs, but we call them, I suppose, a spit with um, 
long grass is standing by the sea watching migration. You just have these clouds of small birds heading over all the time. And it's really exhilarating. You don't know what they are, but it's just amazing to see them. And these are American robins, uh, another bird which in the States, in some areas is a resident, in other areas it's a winter visitor, in other areas it's actually a... Um, why do people call when I'm actually talking? Um, in other areas it's actually a summer visitor. But there's a classic story of being in Cape May and they had an amazing fall. Now fall is when uh, a bunch of uh, migrants are forced down by weather and they just all end up in one spot or one area. And apparently this fall contained around about a million American robins. And can you imagine this? Walking down the street in Cape May and there's American robins flying everywhere, even between your legs, low down. And during that fall, there was also a load of American warblers. Um, and someone told me a story about a, a guy who wasn't a bird that came out of his house, he had a hedge, and as he came out of his house and shut his door, his hedge exploded like confetti of browns and golds and yellows. All these warblers were sitting in his tree and then suddenly just flew off in one, one lump, and it must have been an incredible vision to see. Um, but more likely are ones and twos or small numbers. This is a hermit thrush, um, another uh, American thrush that migrates through the area. And again, they have separate times of the autumn when birds turn up. So the first part of the autumn will be warblers and then it'll be, it'll be thrushes and then it kind of moves on to different family groups. Um, and you also get uh, waterfowl over as well. These are Brent geese. Uh, in America, they call them brants. And this is a, an American red start, which is nothing to do with our red start. It was named by someone homesick, obviously. It's uh, an American warbler. And in fact, the warblers in America, which are technically called wood warblers or American wood warblers, are actually more closely related to buntings than they are to warblers. So uh, yeah, it's really fascinating seeing migration in urban, area, urban, area, urban areas even elsewhere. But let's come back to the UK. I want to quickly tell you, um, if I haven't before, about my um, urban uh, migration watching in London. I did some stuff in Tower 42, which I think is kind of uh, around here somewhere. <clears throat> Actually around here somewhere, central London. And one of the classic days involved um, seeing, well, migration of raptors, this is a buzzard <clears throat> heading over, but a migration of raptors was our primary uh, reason for being there. Although I had an ulterior motive, because you know me, I'm a bit cheeky. My ulterior motive was to get people to think about looking up, especially members of the press, because they were thinking, what are you doing standing on top of this building, enjoying these views, talking about watching birds? But in fact, I was up there because I wanted people to kind of think about looking up and noticing the fact that birds, no matter where you live, you can be seeing them. And also they migrate over areas despite the fact there might be a city. Because I remember being a kid thinking, oh, birds must skirt around the edges. But in reality, they follow the same flight paths they've followed for eons. But flying over a city, as you can see from this, this image, looking west, you can see green areas. And it's, during, it's in these green areas that a lot of these smaller birds just come down, you know, before dawn to feed. And it's great because it's concentrated, which means that, you know, for example, I'll tell you later when I talk about worm and scrubs, but you go to a, a small area of bushes and there might be quite a few birds there as opposed to one or two that have just arrived. Anyway, I set up the uh, Tower 42 Bird Study Group. <clears throat> and what we did, we set about watching every spring and every autumn, visiting for you know, once a week, for several weeks, spending four hours watching usually nothing, or balloons flying over, or a plane, or maybe a butterfly, or a hornet, but occasionally we got birds heading over. So we saw um, one, in fact there were six territories of peregrine to be seen, um, of the 20 odd that inhabit London. London has the uh, second highest population of, of urban peregrines in the world. Kestrels were actually quite rare. 
Um, in the, how many years we're doing it? Nine years. I think we saw Kestrel maybe three times, which was incredible. But we did see other birds. I mean, this is a hen harrier, for God's sake. A hen harrier flying over central London. In fact, on that day, we also had a male hen harrier fly over, plus a marsh harrier. Incredible. Um, wasn't just birds of prey. We had other birds like rooks. And this is a kitty wake that was <laughs> heading up the Thames, which was incredible. But by far the most poignant uh, migration moment I had was when we saw a hen harrier, sorry, hen harrier, honey buzzard, sorry, a honey buzzard heading over from the south. Um, it was incredible. And I may have told you this story before, but I'll tell you again, I just love this story. First, we saw one flyover, which is amazing. Then we picked up another one, initially flying over Peckham. I love adding that bit in, Peckham. Um, uh, it headed over, and this is the actual bird, and to cut another long story short, instead of carrying on north, it kind of doubled back. It ended up hitting a window of an office, and the guy um, who saw it happen, there wasn't a bird, I had the presence of mind to take a picture of the bird and send it to us, and um, it did have a good ending though. The bird shook itself off after 10 minutes and headed off north. But isn't that amazing? You know, anything can turn up anywhere at any time. Remember that when you're in Surrey, anything can turn up anywhere at any time. What's interesting was further down the road, it's Canary Wharf. And there was a guy that did some research and um, he contacted me back in the early 2000s. And basically, um, Canary Wharf, as you probably know, tall building with a little pyramid on top, it used to have a really bright light on it. In fact, at one point, it was the brightest light in Eastern England. So downstairs on the ground, there's this tiny little park, if you can call it that, concrete with a bit of mown grass and some trees that lined the edge of the park. So it's like a square where people went to have their sandwiches and fags and stuff. But the amount of birds that showed up, firecrests, They've had two records of blight reed warbler, even a wryneck. It's just incredible. Um, you know, wheat ears. It's just incredible. I mean, I turned up a couple of times and I saw wheat ears and I saw a firecrest. It's just incredible the sort of birds that turn up. And these birds are traveling by night and they see this light and they come to the light like moths. It's just fascinating. A migration, I mean, I could talk about this all night. In fact, we should book another meeting, Sophie, and have an all-nighter. Yeah, just get your bottle to wine out. We'll talk all night about migration. Now, let's talk about my patch. I can't do ever do a talk, even if I'm talking about Timbuktu, I've got to talk about Wormwood Scrubs in there. I've got to build it in there. Wormwood Scrubs is my beloved local patch, unfortunately in danger at the moment because uh, of our friend HS2 wanted to, in fact, I already have mown down quite a lot of the, uh, the Northern Edge. But anyway, <clears throat> Um, it's one of those places, if I just go back, um, <clears throat> that I love visiting. It's my local patch. Um, I go there um, all the time when I'm in London. And migration is one of the things that I love noticing. And it's interesting, when you have a local patch, you realise when things turn up. You kind of have a good time. You know, you know that, for example, on March the 14th is roughly the time when the first wheat ears arrive. You know, you begin to become very intimate with what birds turn up and you get very excited. I go here and I feel as if I'm in Norfolk or I'm on the Fair Isles. I'm thinking, right, you know, it could be anything anywhere. I'm going to check these bushes. I'm going to, because the bushes that are there, the vegetation, the habitats, even though they're microscopic, they still resemble the habitats that the birds normally hang out in. So a tide migrant will go to the one gorse bush or they'll go to that area of bramble they'll just go there to feed and it's great because you tend you know you end up seeing your familiar favorites like you know spotted flycatcher and uh meadow pipit is another bird which is interesting actually because it although it's classed as a resident in the uk there's a lot of flux because there are winter visitors coming there are summer visitors arriving i noticed on the scrubs that there used to be six pairs that bred or at least six singing males, and then come late summer, nothing. And then by September, I start seeing meadow pipits again. 
but lots of them sometimes, and especially in the past. So it was clear that there was a, a breeding population that then left and then replaced by a winter population that didn't actually stay because they, they were transient. They could stay for a few days and move on. And I knew that because there was one once that looked very grey and I saw it for a couple of days, maybe maybe a week maximum. Then I never saw it again during the winter, even though there was still meadow pipit there. So there was an interchange of numbers of meadow pipit. But my favourite migrant arriving at the scrubs, which I I love and I feel very emotional when I see it, is the ring oozel. The ring oozel shows up every year on my local patch. And even though they breed in the wilder areas of Wales and Northern England and Scotland, and the birds that we get are probably on their way to Scandinavia, I just can't believe that this, 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 this wild bird shows up on my patch to say hello to me before moving on. I mean, you've got to be in it to win it, you can't just show up and think they'll be there. You have to look for them. But when you see them, they might stop for a second on top of a poplar, look at you and say, hi, I'm on my way, see you later. And then they're gone. You know, it's just one of the things I live for in spring. Right, so I just want to end now uh, on one of the most interesting migrations I've noticed in an urban area. And that is in Georgia, uh, just north of Turkey, and a place called Batumi, which you may have heard of. Batumi, um, is a very fascinating place and that's a, a bigger map of the region to show you the geography but basically it was discovered not even that long ago maybe 14 years ago but a large number of birds of prey coming from the east funnel down this area through Turkey probably even through Israel before heading into Africa and it's one of the largest numbers of birds of prey anywhere moving through it's incredible I went to Batumi a few years ago. It's a beautiful place. Unfortunately, the beach, even though it looks lovely, there are more plastic bottles than there are rocks. It's just incredible how, how much garbage there is, but it is a beautiful place. I hung out in Batumi. There's a lot of Russian money here. Um, they've uh, built it to look like that. And you wouldn't think it's a, a venue for urban birding, but I went to this popular place where you can actually see views of the city and most of those people are looking down the city. I was looking up. Excuse me, and I was seeing numbers, hundreds upon hundreds, thousands of birds of prey, hen harriers, black kites, and honey buzzards in their thousands. This migration was every day from 11 in the morning to 5 at night. The streams upon streams, the sky was never empty. I was just mesmerised watching these birds just drifting over. Um, yeah, and I joined in with the Batumi count we stood i'll show you where we stood in the set but basically these were the counts they had every evening of the numbers of birds heading over and it was just incredible the numbers you know 4563 harriers of different varieties flying over you know it's just incredible i mean during the course of uh, a whole season in the autumn they can have upwards of a million birds passing through and we all stand or sit on the sides of a mountain just outside Batumi, staring skywards, waiting for the show, which you don't have to wait long for because they're flying overhead all the time. We're just looking up, and this is all our scopes, and every moment you will be seeing a raptor heading over. This is a, a honey buzzard with a, with a bee eater. And the scenery is cracking, it's amazing. However, it wasn't always this bliss because when it was first discovered that these birds were heading over, there were hunters. And some of the hunters, um, in the early days, the people would be up there counting, and as they counted, as quickly as they counted, the birds had just been shot down by hunters sitting almost next to them, not quite next to them, but in the same side of the mountain. But the great thing is, this is a very different story to Malta in that they're the conservationists, the ornithologists spoke with the hunters and the people there were quite friendly and they sat with the hunters, they drank with the hunters 
They ate with the hunters and eventually convinced them that the birds that they're shooting are actually part of a bigger picture. And the more they're shot, the less of, you know, less there is for everyone else. And it became a situation where the hunting has diminished a lot. Hunters are, are actually embarrassed to be shooting anywhere near the, uh, the people counting the birds. And this is back in Batumi, just watching this whole spectacle. And there's a lot of outreach now in the city to get people to realize just how important this migration is. The principal bird that these hunters were shooting were honey buzzards. And the reason was that, uh, or is, is the, the fact that honey buzzards, unlike a lot of other birds of prey, put on a lot of fat. They don't actually feed on roots. So the honey buzzards put on weight and they're shot and actually eaten because they've got a lot of fat, whereas the other birds of prey tend to uh, eat along the way. So that is a very quick whistle stop look at migration. As I said, Sophie's organizing an all nighter, so we'll do it another night. If you want to learn more about migration, then there's a couple of books you can pick up. One is by my good friend, Dominic Cousins on bird migration. It's a really nice book that talks, talks you through in very good layman's language the principles of migration, and it's obviously published by the Wildlife Trusts. Um, and another, if you really want to get into it in a big way, is by Dr. Ian Newton, who is a giant amongst ornithologists. Um, his book, Bird Migration, it's a bit hard to get, actually. I think it's out of print, and I did see it on, on uh, eBay for about 500 quid, but if you've got lots of money, you can buy a copy, it's fine. But it's a really good book to get. So guys, thank you once again for allowing me to be with you tonight um, and to bend your ear about migration. I'm, it's a thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's an event, an ongoing event that we know so little about that excites me so much. And I think, you know, get out there tomorrow, start watching June Springs, look at your local patch, check out your urban areas and just see the difference in terms of the birds that show up on migration. You'll be surprised. Thanks very much for having me tonight. Thank you so much, David. That was just phenomenal. I I could quite happily listen to you for hours. So um, maybe if a, a much longer session would uh, be very well um, well received by uh, quite a few of our members as well. Um, we've had a couple of questions in. Um, I think uh, the first one I should mention actually was just. Um, a comment from Bill, uh, who said, what an inspiring talk. More, please, Sophie. Um, that did come in soon after you mentioned the wine. So um, I, I don't know what the motivation was there. Uh, but thank you very much for your feedback. Um, we have a question from Josie. Um, do you think there's an argument for reducing the lighting over cities in order to reduce the impact on migrating birds? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And yes, there is a total argument. In fact, um, in some cities in, in the eastern seaboard of the US, that's exactly what's happening. I was in Cleveland a couple of years ago and they got lights out Cleveland, which is a, a, a group which effectively have been sort of campaigning the businesses around in the center of town to turn off their lights at night. And they run patrols every morning at dawn, walking around the, the bottoms of the building to pick up birds that have been, you know, victims of, of collisions, and to take them to the, you know, to the local animal hospital to try and get them, you know, better. So yes, there is a massive argument because it does confuse birds. I mean, the, the canary wharf thing I told you about is a classic example of birds being drawn to a light, um, and it, it does, you know, you see that on coasts with, um, people's um or not people but the actual um lighthouses you know they're now having to put in special lights to not to to cause all that sort of distress to birds and in fact with the canary wharf 
due to an EU directive, they had to tone down their light um, to stop this whole scenario happening, happening, which meant that subsequently there were less birds. In fact, practically overnight, there were less birds turning up in that small park underneath the building because they were not so distracted. So yeah, there is a massive argument, particularly when it comes to places where there are there is a strong flyway. Um, Britain, there isn't a very strong flyway over Britain, not like there is on the eastern seaboard of, of, of America, for example. So yes, it, there is a massive argument for that. Brilliant. Thank you for asking that question, Josie. It's really fascinating. Uh, right, we've got um, lots of questions coming in now. Um, right, I'm just going to refer to the question on the chat because that came in earlier. Um, it's, uh, yes, from Joanna. Uh, for weeks in February, she was visiting um, a flock of red wings in a small nature reserve in Hackney. Um, is it common to see red, red wings in urban areas? The answer is yes. Um, they are, I mean, they do like to rove uh, where there are berries and often in farmland areas, sometimes you might have areas of hedgerow where there are berries, but they're also that sort of stuff going on in urban areas. And also they, they like to hang out on football pitches and other grassy areas where they can pick up uh, invertebrates. So yes, you, you can see them and field fairs in urban areas. Sometimes in some years, some winters more than others, because especially if it's a very harsh winter, then they'll be drawn to your gardens if you're pointing out windfall apples and things like that for them. Um, or if you even have Cataniesta or Rowan or other berries that they like, they'll be in like a shot. So yes, you can see them. I think they're overlooked quite a lot. Um, and also you can hear them in October when they're migrating overhead. If you go out at night and listen, you hear them calling. So they are quite an urban bird, but sometimes overlooked. Brilliant. Um, I'll keep an eye out. I think I need to go a bit exploring. Yeah, they look like, I mean, sometimes when you see them flying, they look like starlings, you, you know, because they're small thrushes and you kind of, you may mistake them for a starling or a bunch of starlings, but in fact, they're, they're red wings heading over. Oh, fantastic. Um, right, another question. Um, Daniel from Ecuador. Hi, Daniel. Um, <laughs> That's quite nice. Sorry, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, lovely to have you here. How exciting. Um, there's a poorly studied type of uh, migration down here in South America called the Austral migration. Could you please tell us more about it? Um, I don't know much about it, to be honest. I know that there's studies done in places in Mexico. Um, I can't remember the name of the place, but there's one place um, where I think it has the largest amount of any um, place in terms of raptors. I think like some like 14 million or something pass overhead. So it's an incredible number. I think watching for migration in southern uh, or in South America is more difficult because South America is actually the destination for a lot of these birds. So as soon as they kind of arrive in the main area of land, they disperse. And plus, you have you also have the uh, you also have the the expanse of you know jungle, what's left of it, and other areas where they just disappear. So it's a lot easier to see the migration in the bottlenecks such as, you know, in Central America. And it's the same actually elsewhere in the world. You know, you watch for migration at bottlenecks. So at Cape May, it's a spit of land that they travel across and move across to the next part of land. You know, Gibraltar Point is another great example where you're really close to Africa. It's the closest point to Africa. So it's a bottleneck. So those are the real areas you can actually see migration in action. That said, I also, you know, as I've kind of intimated in the talk, if you visit a local spot often, you'll notice migration because birds suddenly show up the next morning and turn up this, hang on, that's, that wasn't there yesterday. You know, they travel by night, they turn up there. So you can actually notice that kind of migration too. I mean, scientifically, you know, it's ringing and all that sort of stuff, satellite tagging, uh, radio tagging, you know, that's how we realize where birds are going. But for the casual observer like us, it's basically going out there and knowing what your local birds populations like and then noticing the difference in the numbers. So to answer your question, no, I don't actually know too much about the uh, that migration route, um, but that would be my thinking on it. 
Fabulous. Uh, well, thank you again for joining us. And that amazing. amazing question. Um, right, more questions coming in. Oh, I've got a, this is a brilliant question. Are there any birds that you would like to see that you have not seen yet from Viv? Great question, Viv. Thank you. Um, I'm not really, I'm not really a lister as such. So I don't really have a, a bucket list of birds, but that said, gun to my head, if there's one bird I wanted to see and one bird I want to find, it's a bird called the Eskimo Curlew, which um, is deemed as being extinct. It used to breed in massive numbers in the Canadian tundra, migrating through the Midwest over the Gulf of Mexico and eventually ended up in the Pampas. But in the early days of the settlement of New York, of, of North America, um, the European settlers there used to shoot them en masse. And the last, well, they used to be in flocks of millions and they died out fairly quickly. But the last official sighting was in 1962 in Texas. And it's one of those mythical birds. There's been occasions when people claim to have seen them. I think that there was another claim in the 80s. And it's one bird that if I found that bird, that would be it. I, I've, you know, I could die very happy. I'm not going to die happy now, but I could be ecstatic. And I'll be hoisted upon shoulders. Um, that would be a nice thing too. So I'd love to see an Eskimo curly. But look, I'm happy to see anything. I mean, I, I saw this guy. I saw this guy the other day. This hoopoo. I see them all the time whilst I'm in Spain. I love seeing anything. I, I love seeing sparrows, I love seeing any bird. But if, if you're gonna ask me for one particular bird, then it'll be the Eskimo Gurley. Brilliant, lovely question. Thank you very much, Viv. Um, right, I have another question coming in. Um, how much do migratory patterns change each year? And what are the main factors that affect them? I noticed more red wings versus field fares this year in Bushy Park. That's a brilliant question. Thank you very much. Um, it's a difficult one to gauge and it depends on many factors and, you know, it depends on available habitat, not only where they winter, but also where they breed. So it depends, that will affect the numbers of birds. It depends on weather conditions. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult one to call actually because one thing's for sure there are less birds than there ever have been you know birds you know there's the numbers of birds individually has, has got has dropped dramatically I, I believe the figure in america for example or north america is about 60 percent of all the birds are gone um and that's due to in mostly in our actions hunting habitat destruction you know climate change all that stuff so in the UK, for example, migration um, back in the 50s and 60s, you often have falls where hundreds upon hundreds of even thousands of birds are to suddenly just drop down and you end up seeing all these birds in bushes and it's be like being in paradise. And those kind of days are very, very far and few between now. I remember once, this is going back 20 years maybe, maybe longer, going to uh, Kent to a place called the Isle of Grain and I went there in October just before dawn I got there and I was driving down a road towards where I was going to park to start birding and the road was completely covered with field fares, red wings and there was a couple of wind chats with them as well covered, carpeted, they just dropped in, it was incredible and I've never experienced anything like that since um, which is sad, it shows that you know numbers of birds are actually not as high as they used to be so you know we have some serious work to do as a species ourselves to protect not only them but the planet and ourselves ultimately brilliant um actually leading on from that question i believe the same person has asked um that they've noticed a huge amount of berries this winter could this be a factor in terms of what in terms of um, uh, in terms of changing change migration patterns um, well, again, if we talk about food, um, the abundance, the availability of food is important for species. And if there is a lot of berries everywhere, then the birds will not necessarily have to be everywhere. They'll have places to feed. When there is a, a, a lack of food, um, that's when you get the concentrations occurring. So if there's more berries this year, it means that, you know, they're more dispersed. 
Um, and if there are more berries where they bred, um, it means that there may be less of them coming over because more might stay behind to feed in the berries that are still available. You know, it's, there's a lot of factors like that involved, but it is down to availability of food, really. Um, if it's a really harsh winter, then you're going to be finding a lot more species, a lot more individuals together in one spot, um, forgetting about their territorial stuff, more interested in just feeding up. Whereas if there's an abundance of food, then they're going to be more spread out, more territorial in the main. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, right, a few more questions. Um, uh, right, a single yellow wagtail appeared in our garden um, on the Wirral Merseyside in February this year. It stayed around for a week uh, or so and then disappeared. We've never seen yellow wagtails here before. Why do you think it appeared? Okay. Oh, what a lovely visit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 and that, well, one question I'd ask is, is it definitely not a grey wagtail? Um, is the question I'd ask because uh, there is this, you know, a similarity. They're both, in fact, the grey wagtail should be called a yellow wagtail and the yellow wagtail should be called the sort of greenish wagtail and the pied wagtail, I say, that's fine, but the white wagtail should be called a grey wagtail. So there is um, that possibility that it could be um, a grey wagtail and if it was a yellow wagtail then there is a possibility also that it could be one of the eastern races of yellow wagtail which would be very exciting for some birders out there who like to uh, to tick that taxa off but anyway even you know without that element of it it's quite interesting to to note i mean look sometimes birds that we dis we think of as being strictly summer visitors do find themselves being found in the middle of winter in the uk i remember walking around my local patch the scrubs one december morning and finding a common red start which should have been in sub-saharan africa but instead it was hanging out on my patch it was before christmas so we quickly dubbed him rudolph and rudolph stayed until february he's one of the best christmas presents i've ever had and i think he was the second ever wintering uh, common red start in britain so you know anything does does and can turn up anywhere at any time you know and there's been a lot of incidences of uh, summer birds summer birds associated with the summer still hanging around in winter here like swallows and even birds like ring oozel there's some that have one or two that have wintered but there's other species that are actually spending more time here anyway um chiff chaffs are an example they used to be classically a summer visiting bird but now you're likely to see them in the winter as well as uh, as with uh, black caps as well so things are changing there is a flux there's a different sort of thing happening now and i think climate change and availability of food and habitat have, have all got their part to play in these changes fantastic uh brilliant uh right uh final question in the q a for the moment so if anyone has any more questions um they'd like to ask uh david please uh, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A function. Um, uh, actually getting used to this multitasking online and on Zoom now. Um, right. Doing well. <laughs> um, thank you for an inspiring webinar. Um, question is, is there evidence of increasing amount of offshore wind energy infrastructure built along the coasts affecting birds migration? That's a very interesting question. It is. I'm, I, I remember talking, someone else talking about that the other day and I think the general consensus was they're not sure um, because seabirds, for example, um, tend to fly low over the sea, um, especially when they're on the move, usually. Um, so they may not necessarily be victims of that. And passerines, I mean, some birds fly very high in the sky, so they're way above the, the actual um, wind farm. So it's a difficult one to answer because I think there still needs to be research done on that. Obviously, it affects some species, like, for example, along the southern coast of Spain, where vultures and eagles are migrating from Africa and they've made it across to mainland Spain and they're gaining height because, you know, whilst, cause what they do is when they, when they migrate, they use thermals. They don't flap like um, most other birds. They conserve their energy by gliding. So they use the thermals and they only travel when the thermals, when the ground's heated and the hot air is rising. 
So they make this 14 kilometer crossing from, from Morocco into southern Spain, but you've got the Levante, Levantine winds which kind of cross. So it affects their spiral. Sometimes if you, if you misjudge it, you end up dipping quicker than you expect and some birds unfortunately perish in the sea but others make it but they're really low so then they try and flap up and go higher and that's when they collide with the um, wind farms and what they're doing in some spots in Spain is they're getting the wind farm owners to um, turn off their wind farms when they know that there's going to be a massive movement when the weather conditions are right so but yeah with guarding the question um, I think there's more research that needs to be done so I, I, I couldn't answer that question. Fantastic. Brilliant question. Thank you very much. Um, right, another question come in. Um, uh, WWT uh, did an interesting research project on the effects of some offshore wind farms on radio tagged uh, hooper swans migrating, if I remember correctly, well worth a Google, apparently. Oh, great comment, Josie. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, David? About the Hooper swans, I don't. I need to know more about that. I can't comment on you know because I don't know the uh, the research intimately at all. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I have no more questions at the moment, um, but I have a question for you. I'd like to know um, where are your favourite places uh, in Surrey to go and watch migrating birds. Well. Being a bit of an urban birder, I've spent time hanging out in Croydon, um, or uh, as it used to be known back in the Saxon days, I think Saffron Valley, which I think is a much better name than Croydon. I should rename it Saffron Valley. So, you know, I've been to you know, places like South Norwood Country Park, and I've been just out into the sort of outskirts of Croydon uh, watching uh, birds there. But I have no one spot, to be honest, because... I'm a drifter. I tend to move around all over the place. But if I, again, if I had a gun to my head, then I'll have to say that I spent in Surrey, I've probably spent more time looking at birds in Croydon than anywhere else in the, in the county. I mean, Thursday oh. Common, all those places obviously I've visited. Yeah. It's good to, it's good to, uh, but I like, I like the challenge. I like, you know, the urban side of it is a challenge because you, you go into these small parks, pocket parks even, and it's just great when you go there and you see a willow warbler or a chiff chaff. To me, it's just amazing to see them there. I mean, it's great to see them in other places that you'd expect to see them. But, you know, I remember once being in a small park, a tiny park, and there was a, a firecrest there. It's like in Croydon. I was like, wow, you know, it's incredible. Right next to the station. Fantastic. Um, I suggest, um, well, we, um, during sort of June, July, time some of our most popular walks are our night jar walks um which obviously um a lot of our members um have been unable to sign up to or attend um the last year so um uh, perhaps we'll see quite a few people looking Fingers night crossed. jars yes yes restrictions lifting and then more people can go on our walks um but um yeah, there's uh, lots of amazing things to see on our reserves um as well perhaps we can invite you over there That'd be great. Um, when we can. Um, wonderful. I don't have any more questions. Um, so um, all I will say is, David, thank you so much for joining us again. It's been an absolute joy. Um, and I'll save the best comment to last uh, from he Emma, who is related to Bill, um, who is very excited about the prospect of uh, talking about urban bird migration and wine. Um, so she just wanted to make sure she she uh, let you know about that comment. Um, well, thank you again for coming, and we will definitely see you again very soon. Um, it's just a joy to watch you, um, and thank you for asking all our questions and um, being so knowledgeable. And your photographs were just astonishing. Again, just <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. That was a sheer joy to watch. Um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, well, we have got more talks coming up um, soon. Uh, we have a fantastic talk called The Aliens Amongst Us, 
um, which promises to get into the sort of um, real up and close and personal with um, insects um, and apparently comes with a health warning um, so it would be quite gory and fascinating if you'd like to sign up for that um, and obviously we have lots of more talks and coffee mornings and other activities and uh, I, I will be talking to David tomorrow and getting him back as well um, he's a core cool part of our talk program um, so <laughs> with um, uh, just to end the evening thank you all so much for coming and uh, keep an eye on the what's on page for uh, more talks and uh, look forward to seeing you then thank you all so much bye thank you.